This is the stem. Right here's some leaves. There's our plant. So you see that the roots, actually a root, a plant's roots in a healthy plant should equal the surface of like if you added up all the little cells in the surface area, the, the root surface area is as large as, in a healthy plant, the top. Hmm. Which is kind of crazy when you think of it, because there's most of the, well, half of the plant you're not seeing. <clears throat> so we talked about photosynthesis, <clears throat> where plants make food, but then there's a digestive process. And that digestive process is called respiration. And that kind of sounds like breathing, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Sweating. <coughs> Which is part of the process of digestion. <laughs> Even more closely associated with plant digestion than human digestion. Of course, if we're not breathing, we're not going to be digesting either. But um, it's really a crucial process in plants because what happens is that the plants make the carbohydrates through photosynthesis, but then they have to use the carbohydrates, so they have to break them back down when they need them for growth purposes or for our metabolic, well, metabolic purposes are part of it. So for growth purposes, they have to break it down again. So I'm not gonna go into really big detail about this and the chemical process, but as a byproduct of it breaking down, plants will excrete certain chemicals. So they excrete <coughs> carbon, well they actually excrete carbon dioxide and water. They take in carbon dioxide and water, <coughs> and they excrete carbon dioxide and water. So, and this is the whole basis of planting trees to prevent global warming. Because what they're doing is they're taking carbon dioxide, and water, so CO2 is what's causing global warming, right? Yeah. And so they're taking CO2 and they're making carbohydrates out of it and they're excreting it, but half of what they excrete goes into the soil rather than the air. And then the other half just gets recycled over and over and over again for food. But half of what they're, the carbon dioxide they're excreting comes out in the soil that they're growing in. So when that meets uh, the hydrogen and the oxygen in the, that's in the water and that they're excreting anyway, under certain conditions, what will form is a substance called carbonic acid. <clears throat> and you don't even have to remember all these names, so I'm going too far. It won't let me go any further. So <clears throat> carbonic acid, you don't even really have to remember this, you just have to remember the process, right? The process is what's important. So they make this acid this acid is capable of breaking any nutrients off clay. Clay holds nutrients, just like we talked about this morning, the biochar holding nutrients, clay soils hold nutrients. The other thing that holds more nutrients than clay soils are, is organic matter. And what's biochar? kind of concentrated organic matter. Humic acid, you must have used humic acid. Powder yeah, I get the powdered stuff from the garden pantry. Yeah, yeah. 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 Great stuff. yeah. So humic acid, what's humic acid? 
comes from peat, right? Just it actually it. comes from coal. Coal. Humic acid actually comes from coal. What is coal? Carbon. Carbon from <clears throat> dead plants. Basically, what coal is, is concentrated compost. It composted, and over time and pressure, it became coal. So it's super high in carbon. Yeah? So is folic acid just filtered humic acid? Fulvic acid is another compound that is also available in compost. Now, I don't know where they get fulvic acid from, so I can't really answer your question. How they, they make. Well, they tell me to use fulvic in hydroponic and humic in dirt. Hmm. So maybe it's further I didn't know processed. It was like a refined. Yeah, I'm not sure. That's a great question. I've always wondered why that was. Yeah. Not why not the two. Yeah. I'm going to find out. Sure. I mean, yeah. <coughs> I'm going to find out. But I know that they're both acids that are highly present in compost. And they are responsible for the plant uh, storing nutrients, hanging on. They've got high electrical charges, and that's why they hang on to nutrients, is that high electrical charge. So when you add humic and fulvic acid to <coughs> soil, to your hydroponic solution, it helps it hold on, because all the nutrients electrically stick to the acid. The acid also will bump nutrients off of anything else that they're stuck to. So say you have some soil uh, and it's hanging on really tight to the nutrients so the plant can't get them, well the humic and fulvic acid will help to release them for use. So compost is high in humic and <coughs> fulvic acid and that very, for that very reason, Sometimes when you get a soil test done on highly organic soils, it will show up more acidic than what is considered optimal. But it, in an organic system, pH doesn't matter quite as much as it does in hydroponics because there are so many other nutrients buffering the action uh, and affecting the availability of the nutrients. So how it works, and we're jumping into soils here, so you'll hear it again in soils, but you have, say so you have, oh, you have all these soil particles. But you have this close-up of a soil particle. And different soil particles or different hydroponic medias have different charges. So that's how nutrients stick on to soil. Nutrients, more nutrients stick on to soil, to clay soil, than sandy soil, because sandy soil doesn't have much charge. So the nutrients just can't stick on there. If you have biochar or organic matter in general, the nice thing is, is that an organic matter particle or biochar, which is concentrated organic matter particle, has both positive and negative charges. And so both positive and negatively charged nutrients will stick on to there. Of course, the positive one will line up with the negative charge. The negative one will line up with the positive charge. So organic matter is better than clay because it holds both positive and negative nutrients. Right? And now biochar is even better because it's concentrated, so it holds even more nutrients than plain old organic matter. That's why that's important. So 
you have, say, this plant again, back to this plant, and it's growing in this soil, and you have lots of particles that are holding lots of nutrients, and you even have maybe, uh, you know, some rocks just that were there to begin with that also have some nutrients. So what does acid do? We talked about carbonic acid. Acid dissolves things, right? If you want to get rid of a body, you dump it into hydrochloric acid, right? <laughs> Just an extreme example. It will dissolve things. And that's what acids do. And they do that by giving off hydrogen atoms and releasing the oxygen. And, and so the carbonic acid that is a result of respiration of plants, so respiration of plants produces this carbonic acid, and the carbonic acid, acids as a whole just give off hydrogen like crazy. Hydrogen is a big bully nutrient. And it will bump off any of the other nutrients it's like the king of the castle, you know, all the other nutrients are the dirty rascals. <laughs> so hydrogen is the bully, it pushes off all the other nutrients. And so when the plant is res respiring, it's giving off carbon dioxide, or car carbonic, uh, carbon dioxide and water, forms into carbonic acid. Carbonic acid works to bump the nutrients off of these off of this rock, off of these little particles, and put it into the soil solution. And then the plant can take it up. So it accelerates the, the, the plant's ability to take up all those nutrients. So it helps the plant eat the nutrients in the soil. Because it couldn't, it's like if, um, you know, have you ever had something you wanted to eat in a stupid wrapper you couldn't open easily? <laughs> You know, or a can without a can opener. And that's kind of the way the plant gets stuck. Where there's, there could be tons of nutrients in the <coughs> soil, but if the plant can't extract them, then they're of no use. On the other hand, you want a bunch of nutrients being tied up in the soil so that they don't wash off. And what makes this whole system so beautiful and and well coordinated and elegant is that the rate of respiration is tied to the rate of plant growth. So, and the metabolism of the plant. So as the plant metabolism increases, as respiration increases, it has the need for more nutrients, but as a side effect of respiration, as respiration increases, carbonic acid production increases, so more and more nutrients are released. When the plant metabolism slows down and respiration slows down, less of the carbonic acid is made, and so the nutrients just stay right where in the soil until the plant needs them. So if the plants are 50-50, the top side is nice and healthy and it's big and the bottom side is nice and healthy and it's big. When, if it's an annual and the top half dies <coughs> off back to just whatever winters, do, does that also happen in the root zones? Yep. Oh, it does? Yeah. Oh. Yep. The roots die too and become food for mm -hmm. microbes. Yeah. And that's why it's actually better unless you've got some really severely diseased roots, it's actually better to just chop the plant off at the root surface, you know, at the soil surface and let the roots rot. Because that's food for the microbes. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, rather than taking it off. Rather than pulling the whole plant out. <clears throat> yep. So why is it that weeds keep coming back when we just mop the roots? Why do weeds keep coming back? Yeah. Um, if they're an annual weed, does everyone know the difference, first of all, between annual, perennial, and biannual? I'll just 
quickly go over that because some of you might not be gardeners, right? So the question was, why do uh, uh, weeds keep coming back if you cut them? And uh, there are different weeds have different survival, well, different plants have different survival mechanisms, and a lot of that is based on whether they're annual, perennial, or biannual, which is something that you should know anyway about plants. So, an annual plant. generally complete its life cycle in one year. Generally. And there's always the rule breakers. Or the misunderstandings <coughs> about plants. A biannual plant will complete its life cycle in two years. Oh. A perennial plant will take many years to complete its life cycle. Okay? So it, and it varies from perennial plant. There's short-lived perennials that might only last a couple of years. There's um, trees that live a thousand years. They're all perennial plants. So does that mean that the act, like annuals, do you have to plant them every year or do they come back? The only way an annual plant will come back every year is if it throws seeds itself. So an annual plant will make seeds in one year. And then if you collect the seeds and replant them, that's one way to get it, to grow the next year. The other way is if the plant just drops the seeds you know, before you have a chance to harvest them. Okay? Hey. So mums are considered annual, meaning you go to get them. However, my mums like to come back, but they come back from, they, it doesn't look like they come back from the seed, it comes back from, you know, whatever. And the keyword is considered annual. Okay. Yeah. Okay? And that's where there is some confusion. Pepper plants are the same. Pepper plants are actually perennial plants. You can take a pepper plant and bring it inside in a heated <coughs> greenhouse and keep it for years, or even inside a sunny room in your house. Keep it for years. And it'll keep making peppers as long as it has some nutritional resources to do so. What kills a pepper plant here is the frost. Or the cold temperatures where it stops taking up food and starts getting sick. And there's many things that can be confused. Also, I have a kale plant that's been there for three years. <clears throat> and it was just a matter of genetic diversity that it lived through and didn't produce seeds. And, um, <coughs> another example is a Swiss chard. Uh, some people call it silver beet. Um, and in Hawaii, and I'm not sure why this is true, but in Hawaii, it just never makes seeds. And yet we consider it an animal plant. So there are phenotypes. So based on the environment, some plants can react differently. But generally, the definition of annual is one year, perennial is two, uh, or biannual is two years, and perennial is many years. What's an example of a biannual? Does anyone know? I do know something. Um, I'm just trying to think. I know there's some in my garden, but. There are there some are. in your garden, and there's some that you eat as vegetables. Asparagus. Asparagus is perennial, many yeah. years. So asparagus yeah, is, that here. asparagus. so let's put a list of these um, examples, say, asparagus. One year would be lettuce. So yeah. annual just means that it'll complete its life cycle within the year. Because within lettuce the year. Very okay. Yeah, within the year. It might be six weeks. Well, actually, the lettuce, by the time it actually puts out seed that's viable, it's pretty well a full year. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, by the time it actually completes that life cycle, but they can be shorter. So there's a big difference too between the way annuals and perennials uptick and store nutrition too, that's right, isn't it? So your annuals are, are taking nutrition continuously out of the ground, which you have to replenish, whereas your perennial systems are sinking nutrition into the ground and, and sequestering all that carbon and all that kind of stuff for themselves. Yeah, so and then also they're dropping off their leaves or plant parts and, and the microbes eat it and turn it into food <coughs> for them. That so is you're, absolutely you're correct. And biannual, and no one's given me an example yet. <coughs> biannuals are two examples. Carrots, yeah. Three examples of food that we eat that are biannuals, beets, carrots, and onions. Yeah. What they do is they produce lots of top growth, and then they store their extra food in their root. We love to eat that extra food that they've stored. Mm. But if we didn't eat the extra food that they've stored, the second year, mm. they use that extra food to put out this massive seed structure, flower and seed structure. Wow. Right? So then they complete their life cycle year mm. two. So but they're storing that food, not for us. <laughs> they're storing that food so that they have lots of energy to make nice, strong, vigorous seed the next year. So my carrots that I put in in the autumn that are overwintered, um, sh I should leave some of those now to go to seed and then just harvest the seed and, and go Probably to not, and I'll tell you why. They might not, are they fully developed now? They're small, but they're but they're they're tiny carrots. They're yeah, they're in good shape, I think. But if they are have not re, um, reached their genetic potential, say if they were a seed from a carrot that was supposed to be big and it only got small, mm -hmm. then you're saving inferior seed. Okay. Carrot so is won't... also really hard to save because it cross pollinates with Queen Anne's lace. Right. Mm. So you might get a very inedible. Oh, interesting. Product, okay. very bitter and inedible. Is so that you should a just. Flower? Queen Anne's lace is a flower, yeah. It, it's like a. a it's the same family. Breed. It's like yeah. wild. It's so a wild carrot. So really. what would you get? What you would get is well, the Queen Anne's lace has a heavy white root, but it tastes really bitter. <laughs> And so you might even get an orange root that tastes bitter, or you might get a white root that tastes sweet, but chances are it won't be very good. And it's all often very tough, even if it tastes sweet. Okay. So yeah, carrots have to be really isolated to save the seed. Oh, gotcha. Okay. And, and, but. Would you just um, put it in like a hoop house? Like, like to cover yeah, that's what most people do, is put it in some kind of hoop house and gauze it over, like with really fine material so that nothing can get in to cross pollinate it. Yeah. So back to weeds, um, the question originally was weeds. And so an annual weed, its survival of the species, well, any annual plant, including weeds, its survival of the species uh, kind of strategy is to produce lots and lots and lots of seeds, right? And so if you have this annual weed, its whole purpose in life, its whole driving force in life is to produce lots of seed in a really short period of time because it's only got one chance. And so you can cut the top off that, but it's gonna try to do it again really quickly because that's its whole <coughs> purpose in life is to try to produce seed. So it's going to keep trying to do that till it totally exhausts nutritional resources. With a biannual weed, of which Queen Anne's Lace is actually a good example, Dock is another good example, if you know what that looks like. Um, develops a heavy, heavy tap root. Any weed that develops a really, really heavy tap root is probably either a biannual or a perennial. Mm. And so what it does, you know, you cut it back and 
it doesn't even, it has all this root below the surface and it'll just translocate some of its energy from that root to build a new top. That's why you see weeds growing in the cement, right? Because And then they'll keep on coming up every time someone pulls it out and you're like, oh, come on, I just pulled you. And then it's like, it pops right back up. <laughs> yeah, because from a, a little tiny, the weeds are very efficient plants, really. Yeah. And the, if they have a big <coughs> root like this, there's a lot of food stored in that. And so from even a little tiny piece, which the comfrey is a perfect example. I mean, you could dig out a comfrey plant, but if you leave a little tiny piece of comfrey in there at all, it's got enough nutrients stored in it that it's going to grow a new plant. Why well, can't stuff we want to grow be like that? I know, <laughs> because we have bred it for taste. We've selected it for taste and shippability, but really, Edible weeds have far more nutrients than anything we could grow. They just don't taste good. They just don't. I said they just don't taste good. Some, Some of them actually do taste good. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, chickweed is a great example. Okay, Monday for lunch, I will bring in. I'll see what I can find, and I'll bring in an edible weed dish. There's lamb's core, cool. there's mm -hmm. miner's lettuce, yeah. there's, uh, there's Corn thousands. salad, mache, it was actually mache. a weed. Um, the one that tastes like lemon. Um, Sorrel. Sorrel. Yeah. Sorrel. Oh, that's so, and then perennial weeds, well, they just have such a complicated root structure, and that they're so tough, <coughs> and they'll just keep coming back. Yeah. So it's really important to catch annual weeds before they go to seed though mm -hmm. even if you have to knock them year. back because one year's seeds <coughs> equals seven years weeds mm. most weeds have seeds that are viable for seven years also they just might not germinate the first go around and then they could just mm -hmm. be like hey i'm still your buddy but yeah every, every, t every time you till you're bringing those old seeds back to the surface so that's yeah. what tilling actually does is it's it's sending more a, weeds. yeah it's just it, more weeds. it's sending a signal to the weeds hey this is bare soil we got to cover this up some idiot <laughs> just wiped up all the the growth here that's protecting the soil and yeah. the weeds actually serve a purpose yeah so if annuals um, go through their life cycle once a year do they not they don't necessarily die every year though like what would it like <coughs> Well, some perennials will. Oh. So perennials are actually really successful structures because quite often they both live for many years, produce seed crops every year, and some of them will even spread in alternative ways. And the best example I know is Himalayan blackberry. Hmm. For one thing, it's got fruit with lots of seeds. One day I was walking along and I went, oh, bear poop, I can bring it home for manure. And my friend said, you really want all those blackberry seeds in your garden? And I went, oh, duh. <laughs> Teach the horticultural something, right? The blackberry poop is gonna be full of seeds. That's the whole reproductive strategy of the blackberry is to have tasty fruit so that an animal eats it and then drops its seeds someplace else to colonize, right? And so it has the seeds, it has, it's perennial. It lives from year to year. And also it has the capacity to vegetatively reproduce if that, if that branch arches down and hits the ground, it forms roots. So yes, it's a perennial, but it has more than one survival strategy, and that's quite often when things become invasive, is when they have more than one survival strategy. And comfrey is actually the same thing. It, uh, although it doesn't have fruit, it has a couple of different survival strategies and reproductive strategies, and then it keeps sending offshoots off the side of the plant, mm. making more and making the clump bigger and bigger and bigger, mm. And it also flowers, and if that flower goes to seed, then it will reproduce by seed as well. So perennials are very successful. They have lots of successful survival strategies. 
And that's why many people are advocating for things like perennial grains, right, in the prairies. There are perennial grains and people are working on them to see if they can get them so that they would be suitable for uh, human consumption. So they're selecting uh, the best of perennial grain. And perennial crops in general are very successful because they're less labor intensive because you don't have to plant them that every year. Asparagus, mm -hmm. rhubarb, raspberries, sorrel, uh, you know, all perennial crops you don't have to plant every year and yet they will continue to produce as long as you have an ex they don't exhaust the soil around them. They will continue to produce. So our job is only to keep, you know, feeding the soil around them. And biannuals, um, you know, they will store, effectively store a bunch of food. So that's, um, that's a little bit of that, which I'm glad that that question was asked because it actually covers a lot of things. Okay. Yeah. Oh, mycorrhizae. Mycorrhizae we talked about yesterday as well. Mycorrhizae are the vegetative body of mushrooms, or, or one Wednesday, vegetative body of mushrooms, and they spread through the soil, they gather water and nutrients. But mycorrhizae also have another trick. They can wrap around rocks and they can extract nutrients from rocks. Because of a similar process as the acid mining. So they can take phosphorus out of rock. I mean, really, rock phosphate. Have you ever used rock phosphate in your garden? It's just ground up rock, right? I mean, how can a plant drink ground up rock? Plants take up their nutrients by drinking. If it's finely ground enough, they can take it through that endocytosis where they wrap their cells around it if it's really finely ground, mm -hmm. and they can absorb it that way. But most of the times, it just sits in the soil without the action of microbes. The microbes eat the rock dust, or the mycorrhizae wears away at the rock dust and makes it available for the plants to then absorb, because it can't absorb it otherwise. So it, it would like be trying to eat uh, something that's in a plastic wrapper. When you talked about like the MPK ratios and how in the in industrial fertilizers they're, they're bound to something terrible and to make up the rest of that hundred percent. When you were referring to the organic versions of that, um, with the lower numbers, is is the the binder or whatever it's attached to? That's the actual rock part yes. of it. So the yes. the filler in, in in that sense is is the rock. That's what makes up the difference. That's that right. Correct. It's either the rock or the plant part. Like in the case of alfalfa, it's the alfalfa stem and right. leaves and all that stuff. Um, in the case of the rock phosphate, it is just the whole part of that rock that is not soluble, okay. that's not easily, readily available for the plant to take up. But through microbial action, there's a lot more nutrients it's just the way fertilizers are labeled that they're only labeled to tell you what is immediately available. And actually, that's the same with soil tests. Soil tests will only tell you the nutrients that are immediately available. They will not tell you the sum total of nutrients in your soil. If they use that there's no soil testing that I know that uses strong enough acids to release <coughs> all of them. There's other methods of doing it, but the standard soil test will not do it. And so standard soil tests do somewhat fall a little short in giving you the complete information that you need as an organic gardener. You can only use that as part of your decision-making process, not the entire thing. Interesting. Yeah. So mycorrhizae fungi do that same sort of thing. They release the nutrients. And then the biological transmutation, we talked about it again. And I, I'm just going to tell a little story about it so you understand kind of the process. And um, dandelions, we were talking a bit about dandelions the other day. They're weeds. And, and like he just said, 
the earth actually will want to cover itself and that's the natural process is to mother nature or the universe or the earth or just the way the earth systems work or however you want to think of it um, would prefer not to have bare soil it would prefer to keep soil covered but not only that to protect the soil not only that if you look more closely many times weeds will actually be key to repair nutrient deficiencies in the soil. So if you're a long-term gardener, what you will notice is the weed populations change on your soil. So one year you'll have a lot of this weed. The next year you'll have a lot of another weed. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of going, where are these coming from, you know? like. Well, why is this happening? <coughs> but if you look more closely, many weeds are what's called dynamic accumulators. Mm. And so they accumulate certain nutrients, and quite often they're the exact nutrients that the soil is deficient in. And so how do they do that? Like... How do they, like, how does that happen? So I'll give you an example. The dandelion is the best example of biological transmutation. Dandelions grow in calcium deficient soils. If you get a book uh, called Indicator Plants BC, mm -hmm. it's used by foresters to look at a plot of land and tell what the soil is by what weeds are growing there. And dandelions will grow in calcium deficient soils. But if you look at the tissue of a dandelion, it's calcium rich. Where the heck is that dandelion getting the calcium? It's trading hockey cards with the bacteria. <laughs> Part of it, yeah, part of it. Well, well, to make a chemical process to change that. It's a chemical process. It's the biological mm -hmm. transmutation. There. <laughs> so here's some examples of biological transmutation. And here, <coughs> oh, I'll get it. Here is the one that the dandelion is using. I think I trust no. you. <laughs> Is it this one? Yeah, to make calcium. Yeah. So, no. I didn't actually include it on this one. I didn't actually include it. There's another one that makes calcium. I think it's silica. Yes, that's what it is. So. <laughs> I'll just do this. So make believe the case not there. So what this is, is sort of 23 atoms of this and um, oh, this is the atomic number. This is the amount of little particles that are going around in the atom. And so what happens in the case of a dandelion is that there's silica in all soils, right? And silica is SI, which I've written over the K here. There's silica, its atomic number is 39. Hydrogen, its atomic number is 1. But you could have another hydrogen there. Hydrogen is also very common, right? It's in the air we breathe all over the place, hydrogen, hydrogen. So you could have another hydrogen with an atomic number of one. And so what you have, what is possible in biological systems is to combine the silica in the soil with the hydrogen that's in the air or in the water and do calcium. 
And if you look at the atomic numbers, they just add up. The atomic numbers add up. So then are they using their taproot then to sink that calcium into the soil? Well, it's in all their tissues. That's why, what, if you eat dandelion greens, you're eating a calcium rich dish. And yet, the soil it's growing in has no calcium. Even when they dug down deep to look where the roots were going, there was still very little calcium or very little available calcium in the soil. So the plant is able, within its tissues, to do something that would yield a chemical formula that if I wrote it on my exam in my chemistry class, I wouldn't be standing in front of you teaching now, I'd be waitressing still. <laughs> because it won't happen in a test tube. It will not happen in a test tube. If you took those elements and tried to pull off all the electrons and combine the atomic numbers, we, you know, we couldn't do it in a test tube. Couldn't do it in a lab. Without the use of either bacteria or a human system or a dandelion or a plant. So it's really controversial. Um, some people, can't, you know, they, they can't figure out how it works. But antidotally, there's lots and lots and lots of examples. So there's lots of scientists have looked and observed this kind of thing. So um, it's one of those um, things that we're really suspecting uh, work, but we don't quite know how. <laughs> Keep hitting the wrong one. <laughs> so let's go back. So we talked about the acid mining, we talked about mycorrhizae, we talked about biological transmutation. So that's all how plants are eating. Here's just a little review of it. And here's the clay particle we talked about. There's all this calcium <coughs> stuck onto the clay particle. Clay in this case has negative charges. Different clays have either positive or negative charges. Most in the temperate zone have negative charges. And then the potassium in this case has a positive charge. It's stuck onto the clay. As a result of the respiration, carbonic acid is produced. Here's the formula. Um, acids do what they do. They give off hydrogen. The hydrogen bumps the potassium off and makes it available. So. Long story short, we'll go over this again and again. We'll go over it again in soils. Mycorrhizae fungi are responsible for the uptake of phosphorus and nutrients in water and some nitrogen because they can wrap around rocks. They can wrap around organic matter. They can wrap around things and extract these nutrients and deliver it right to the plants. They also can wrap around the roots and defend the plants. They have that same ability as a lot of microbes do to produce substances that kill diseased organisms. So the promix with mycorrhizae that they use has already helped to inoculate your plants against soil-borne diseases. Right? That's why it's important. Also, it'll help it gather water and nutrients. So um, I just have a quick technical question on the mycorrhizae then. So I used lots of ProMix last year um, when I was putting beds into my garden. I haven't added any of that this year, but would you expect that kind of network to, to be inoculating kind of all areas of, of the garden? As long as you time? haven't severely disturbed the soil, okay. that network will continue to grow. And that's another reason to just cut the plants off at the soil level. Mm -hmm. And, and let the roots stay in there because the roots will continue to, uh, the mycorrhizae will continue to grow. And then what will happen is that you might even see, like since I've been using mycorrhizae in my garden, I have all kinds of weird mushrooms coming up. None of them are edible, mm -hmm. uh, but there are all kinds of weird mushrooms coming up all over the place. And they're the vegetative body of this mycorrhizae. And then what happens is the spores drop to the ground and sort of sift down in the soil. And then when the new plant's roots, uh, that's one way, is that when the new plant's roots come in contact with the spores, the new spores start to grow. They get their food from the root and they start to grow. 
Also, when there's a mycorrhizae network there, of course, they're going to be attracted and grow towards any new plants that you plant. Because again, that's their source of food. They can't make cars. So they're going to search out, oh, there's a root. You know, and they're going to grow towards the root because they know that's where food is. So by not disturbing the soil, you continually enhance your mycorrhizal colonies, enhancing your plant's abilities to um, communicate and transfer water and nutrients throughout the soil ecosystem. I wanted to throw it a bit there for the students who discovered these honey fungus growing up in his garden and he noticed that they were swarming with bees. And these bees are coming and eating the fungus and they take whatever chemicals they get out there and use it to make propolis and something else that makes their really? hives strong. And without the mycelium connection, they, they're noticing in areas that used to have a lot of dead trees with like bare scratch where there was fungus growing, where they're clearing all that out and taking out the forest, the bees are eating and that kind of thing. So there's a fungus draw there and they need that. Yeah, he discovered huh. the symbiotic yeah. relationship. I didn't realize with bees that and bees had a relationship yeah. with yeah. mushrooms too. Yeah. That's very interesting. We also talked about trading with allies, and we talked about how plants, 50% uh, or more, they feed the microbes that provide nutrients, water, and defense for them. So whether it's mycorrhizae, uh, whether it's nitrogen-fixing bacteria, whether it's those bacteria that live on the surface of the leaf, uh, the plants are always feeding their community. They're providing food security <coughs> for their community. And in return, their community provides them with um, the, the building blocks, the nutrients, basic nutrients, uh, with water and with defense. So it's a, a really uh, efficient trade situation. So this biological transmutation, transmutation has been talked about since the 1700s, if you can believe it. And yet, very few people have even heard of it, even in you know horticultural science. And as long as it's a living organism, um, that is, there, it has that capability under the right conditions to uh, perform biological transmutation. And so we talked about the dandelion and its role.